One of the uh, funny stories that I, that I think about is the idea that um, this man was sitting in his office and he had his feet kicked back on his desk and he's all stretched out and had his hands behind him like this and he was there just gazing out the window about ready to take a nap. And the boss kind of looks in there and says, why aren't you working? He says, I didn't see you coming. <laughs> And isn't that kind of true that that's the way it kind of is in our Christian life? Sometimes in our Christian life, we forget that he's coming back. And we forget that the promise is not just for today, but the promise we have is for tomorrow. And, and there is a day of victory coming. And it's coming, but it, it may be coming later on, but we've got to realize we've got work yet to do while we are here, and we need to encourage each other, encourage ourselves to get back to the work. During this sermon, I want you to realize that Satan has only one question that he's asking today. And the one question that he's asking today is this one, one question. What do I have to do to get you to quit? What do I have to do to get you to quit serving God, to, to quit believing in prayer, to, to quit opening up your Bible, to quit doing what God has asked you to do? What do I have to do to get you to quit? And I've got another question that I believe God is asking us today as the church. What do I have to do to get you to start? What is it that you need for me so that you will start reading your Bible and start praying and stay focused on me. It's so easy to quit. It's hard to keep going. I want us to look in Luke, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and we're going to kind of pick through this whole chapter. There's 58 verses and we're going to kind of speed through it as quick as I can. But you've got to start at the beginning to understand the ending of it. And the very first verses he says this, Now I make it known to you, brothers, the gospel which I preach to you, which you also have received, in which also you stand. Now you need to kind of put a dot by that word stand. Uh, because when you get to the end of this, when you get to chapter verse 58, you'll understand that this word is very important. By which also you are saved. And then there's another scary word. If you hold fast to the word which I preach to you. He's telling this congregation, and see, 1 Corinthians had a problem. They had several problems. In, in the book of Acts, you see that Paul had three missionary journeys. And in these missionary journeys, he would start churches. Then he would go back to the established churches and encourage those churches. While he was encouraging, uh, encouraging the churches, he'd also go back and try to fix some mistakes. 1 Corinthians has a lot of mistakes in it. Number one, they're bragging on who baptized them and who they're affiliated with. And Paul says that's not the point. We're baptized into Christ. We're not baptized into Apollos. We're not baptized into Paul. You're baptized in. Quit doing that. Number two, they were bragging on their spiritual gifts. Look what I can do. Look what I can do. And Paul says they're worthless. 1 Corinthians 13. If you don't have love, these are worthless. The, the most important spiritual gift we can have is love. They also had a problem with sin in the church, and they were bragging on a guy that was fully intoxicated in a sexual sin, and they were bragging on it, and Paul says, stop. Tell him to repent, and if we don't repent, kick him out. Side note, I'd be a little nervous in Paul's church, wouldn't you? He, he's, you know, if you're, not, if you're not living right, we're going to kick you out. They dealt with sin very seriously. And I'm wondering, as I was studying this, why have we kind of become laxed on that? I think it's because we don't believe how serious it is. And maybe we have the same problem that they also had with this last problem is, they started doubting whether or not Jesus actually arose from the grave. They started doubting the fact whether or not we're going to rise from the grave. And Paul says this, you know, hold firmly to this teaching, this what I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, in this passage, the word vain and the thought vain is used several times. And there's two Greek words for the, for the word vain. And I was trying to figure out why did he use two different words? And the Greek language is so precise that you can't just use the word vain. You've got to understand what he's saying. One term is what's done to you. 
if it's not done right to you, then it, it's wasted. The other term is what you do to somebody else. The, so the work ethic that's going out from you, is it of any value? One is the value that's placed towards me, the other is the value that's placed for me out. And he said, unless your belief is in vain. The word vain is also used in verse 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am today, and his grace towards me did not prove worthless. You see, that's to him. And what God did for me did not prove worthless. But I labored even more than all of them. And he's talking about the other apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God in me. Now let me do another side note. You're getting like three sermons in one today, and I'm not going to charge you two extra. All right? I'll just give you this. It's free. Put it in your, wherever you want it, and you can bring it back later. When God gets a hold of you, God gets a hold of you. It's wonderful to see someone come to Lord Jesus Christ and the excitement that they have and the zeal that they have and the fervor and they want to get in their Bibles and they want, what other meeting can I come to? And they're just overly excited. But somewhere along the way, we lose our step. Uh, I'm training for a terrain run. I, I've done a lot of running and I've got two bad knees now and I don't run as fast as I used to and my sister-in-law talked me into this. Uh, I think Vicky's whole family's out to kill me. I think she's got some kind of a, you know, something out there. It's, it's really weird because we started off with a 5K run, which is three miles. I agreed to a 10K, and now I'm doing a terrain run, which is a 5K with 22 obstacles. What kind of an idiot would sign up for this? Well, I didn't sign up for this. My sister will sign me up for this. And I'm trying to train for this, and, and I'm training now because every so often you've got to stop and do something else. So the training I'm doing is running for three minutes, stopping for two minutes. You get my heart to adjust up and down. Well, I can do about three or four of those pretty good. The last seven, I'm almost crying. Dear Lord, just take me home now. You know, this is terrible. And our Christian life is that way. We start off so excited. But somewhere along the way, we kind of lose our zeal and we lose our excitement. And, and things start creeping in and what was important is no longer important. And what do I have to do, Satan asks, to get you to quit? What do I have to do to get you distracted? And he says here... I worked hard, but it wasn't me. It was God's grace in me. And the excitement. I mean, I tell you, there's nothing more exciting than knowing that God is using you for something greater than you. And God, I believe that about this church. I believe God has got plans for this church that he wants to blow our mind of what we're going to do to our community. But we've got to have the zeal and excitement to get it done. He's going to do it through us. Look at verse 11. Whether then it was I or they... So we preached so you could believe. The word gospel is used several times in here, and I was very excited about reading the word because if you look on some of these bracelets we have from Jace, he had it tattooed on his arm. Euangelion. And every time I see that word in the Greek, it just kind of chokes me up a little bit. But that's what we're all about. Preaching the gospel. Also again in verse 16, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You see, there's two sects of Jewish leaders, and the Christian faith come out of the Jewish faith, and there's two sects of Jewish leaders, and one were the Pharisees, and they believed in the resurrection, and the others were the Sadducees, and they were Sadducee because they didn't. They believed it was all about the here and now. And Paul goes on to say, look at verse um, 18. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we should be pitied above all men. Have you noticed about the modern preaching? The modern sermons are how to get through the here and now. We focused on all the troubles we have, and, and my wife and I were talking. We'd love to just be up to one income. Wouldn't it be nice that you could afford to live on just one income? But our society, we've, we've raised the bar so high, it's expensive. You need two incomes. I can't wait until my wife gets to one income so I can go fishing more. If it's only for this life, if Christianity is only helpful for this life, 
it's worthless. What do I have to do, Satan asked, to get you to quit? Paul goes in to say, what do we have to do to get you started? Look at verse 50. Now I say, brothers, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery, for we will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will rise imperishable and will be changed. For the perishable must put on imperishable and the mortal immortality. But then the saying, I want to go down here, comes true. Death is swallowed up in victory. Don't stop yet. Don't quit. Victory's around the corner. Victory is obtainable. It's not here yet, but your victory is coming. Don't quit now. I was talking to some people out in the hallway. I want to know if they remember the Heidi Bowl. Do you remember the Heidi Bowl? You don't. I'm disappointed in you, coach. Uh, does anybody remember the Heidi Bowl? We've got one guy because I told him out in the hallway. That's why he knows. In not November 17, 1967, the Jets were playing the Raiders. Two minutes left, and they wanted to switch over. NBC wanted to switch over to the movie Heidi. You know it now, don't you? Yeah, you woke him up, didn't you? You had to explain that. I love how you did that to him, Angela. Yeah, way to have a football heart, Angela. The game, ah, they're down by two scores. There's no way in two minutes they can come back and win. Well, as Heidi is being played and aired, they had to scroll across the bottom. The Raiders come back and beat them, and, and no one saw it. Because everybody give up on them. I was there in 1999 with the preseason when uh, Green, Trent Green, was playing in a preseason game and Falk was supposed to get, they knew the blitz was coming and Falk was supposed to get the safety coming across and it was, it was Harrison, he was going to blitz and he was supposed to pick him up. But the trouble was Falk had just started just, just a few months earlier and he didn't really know all of the plays and he was uncomfortable in his position. So when he went to get Harrison, he kind of did a half-hearted block. And when Harrison come by, you could hear the legs snap on green come full tilt. We all throw our hands up there. I was living in Troy at the time and the Rams were there and I got free tickets. I'm like, well, it's over with. You know, there's no way we're ever going to win. There's, you know, we lost, we paid all this money for this guy. And a grocery store bagger by the name of Kurt Warner comes into play. And that year, the Rams win the Super Bowl with a guy who previously was just bagging groceries. The next year, Trent Green becomes the backup quarterback for the guy bagging groceries. When we were there, the thing I thought was interesting, after they won the Super Bowl, uh, Kurt Warner and several of the guys on the team were Christians, and they rented out the, the Rams Stadium and they had a men's conference that was totally free and they bought you lunch, it was a two-day conference and Kurt Warner stands up and says, we only won the Super Bowl for one reason, so that we could get you here today for this. That was more important to him than the Super Bowl. Your victory is around the corner. I love how Paul goes to this point, you, you, you don't quit right now, don't give up on me, don't stop now, there is victory coming, there is a day of reckoning going to happen, death will be swallowed up in victory, oh death where is your victory, oh sting, uh, oh grave where is your sting, and I love how he just stands over that and mocks it, he goes on to say the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through Jesus Christ. If you're going to be a Christian, be a victorious Christian. Don't be a defeated one. No one wants to see a sour Christian. One man put it this way. It said, it looked like we've been baptized in bulldogs and lemon juice. And, you know, the, the meditation today. You have a sour face. Who would, want to go to, who would want to go to church with you? If it does it to your face, I don't want to do it to my face. 
I want to go somewhere do I know I can drop my burden and know that there's victory coming. And he goes on to say this, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. I like how it puts it in the message. Look at the first stanza with all this going for us. With all this going for us. Stand your ground. Don't lose any. He goes on to say, don't hold back. Give them both barrels. Go out fighting. I don't care if you're down by two touchdowns with two minutes left. You go out fighting. I don't care what the doctor says. You go out fighting. I don't care what happens. But here's the deal. Satan wants you to quit. Satan wants you to give up. Just give up. And some of you are here today and you're at that point. You just want to throw your hands up in here. I'm done. I'm done. I have seen it in people. And it's just, you, you got to get back on your knees. you got to get back into the Word. Don't stop now. And they're like, I, I just can't fight it anymore. I'm done with it. I'm done with church. I'm done with the whole thing. I, I'm, I'm done with it. it. It's not working. Man, where is that drive? Let me tell you this. If you're a Christian in the workforce, you need to be the example. Your boss should pull you out of the crowd and say, you need to be more like this person. If you're a Christian in the sports world, you need to be the example. You should be the one showing up early. You should be the one going to bed late. You should be the first one on your phone waiting for the new video to come through so you can see what you can do better. You should be the example. My boys hate our family theme. Our family verse is Colossians 3.17. And, and they can they, you look at the look on their face right now. They hate it. They hate it. And I got it from when I was in basketball in college because it's also said in 1 Corinthians 10.31. If I ever get a tattoo, which I, I probably never will, but I want that tattooed on my arm. 1 Corinthians 10.31 or Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do, you do it to the very best of your ability because you're going to glorify God doing it. You go out fighting. You go out like a champion. You go out and let them know that they, they tore into somebody when they tore into you. When I was in college, St. Louis Christian College, we had to play Oakland, Oakland City University. They were the NCAA Division B team. First time we played them, they mopped the floor with us. The water boy was seven foot tall. I went to go around to pick. I picked myself up off the floor. I went to try to steal a ball, and I thought I was going to pull back a nub how fast they threw. I mean, they snapped that ball to each other. It was scary. I asked my coach, why are we here? And he said, well, they bought your tennis shoes. <laughs> it was a, we had to go play them again. And our coach set us down and said, Guys, you went in there with defeat on your mind. You already knew you lost. He said, I want them to know they tied into somebody. And here's the reason. We're coming in here as a Christian college. They think we're just a bunch of preachers with no, we don't have anything to do. I want them to know that we're a bunch of Christians, soldiers for Jesus Christ. We lost that game too, but we only lost it by like 10 points. At halftime, they were down by two. When the game was over, their coach made them run because he was mad. We embarrassed them. A bunch of preachers, untalented nobodies, embarrassed you in public tonight. What was surprising to me was their captain was the first one back. People doubt you. If you're a Christian... You should be the example in everything you do. You're the very best at it. Because you're going to glorify God through it. Look what he says. Throw, throw yourselves fully into the work of the Master confidently, knowing that anything you do for Him is not a waste of time. The word vain, no purpose, or void of results without effect. Do you feel like that's your life? What's the purpose? Do you have any results? Is there anything changing in your life? How are you affecting your society for Jesus Christ? A church should feel like we are effective. Things are changing in us. And here's the idea is you've got to stand your ground. I am so sick and tired of everyone telling the church to shut up. I'm sick of that. 
I'm sick and tired of people not wanting to hear from us. And I'm really upset that we cower anytime we get confronted with something. We just hold back. Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 39 says, we are not of those who hold back. We give them both barrels. We give them everything we've got. We might come out of the, the battle bruised, beaten, and bloody, but they're going to know they tore into something bigger. Because we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. And the idea with this is you've got to serve Jesus with conviction. If you believe something, you're going to live that belief. That's what he says here, Isaiah, or 1 Corinthians 15, 58. The whole idea is you keep going because you have something to believe in. Paul goes on to say the same thing in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. What I believe I'm convinced of. Men, you know what I'm talking about being convinced. How many of you men have been convinced of something even though your wife said you're wrong? How many of you have been proven wrong by your wife but you're still convinced you're right? I'm right there. I don't know how many times my wife has proved me wrong. Some of you are getting the cold eye. Don't look at her. She's looking right at you. Don't look back. I have been, I am convinced I'm right. The other day I told my wife I was 47. She said, you're 46. I should know how old I am. She said, well, do the math. I did the math. I come up 46. <laughs> but when I did the math, I put down 2020. And I showed, look, it says 47. She said, give me your phone. It's 46. I couldn't prove her. Yeah. Where is that kind of conviction in the church? I am convinced that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I am convinced that he can change your life for better. I am convinced that he's coming back. I am convinced that he gives me the Holy Spirit. I am convinced that I'm going to make it. I'm not just going to make it. I'm going to conquer it. What happened to the conquerors? Jesus just didn't barely get my sins freed from me. He conquered Satan on the cross. And Paul says that I am more than a conqueror. I don't believe in weak-livered Christians. I believe when we walk into a room, they know there's something about us. They know there's something different. It's because the way we walk, the way we live, we are convinced Jesus is my Savior. I'm convinced in the power of the Almighty. How about some enthusiasm? How about getting excited that Jesus saved you from your sins? Getting it, man, this week, I baptized a 76-year-old man. He said, I want to get baptized. Woo! I didn't change the baptistry heater. I didn't change my clothes. I had a pair of blue jeans on. I kicked off my shoes. I said, let's do this. And we did it. I had asked the secretary, I need to go home. Why? Because I wet myself. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm wet from down here. I was excited. He came in here fire, on fire. Man, changing people's lives, watching what God's going to do. How about some enthusiasm? Man, I've heard you yell at ball games. I told Vicky, sorry, Lucas. I told Vicky, I was on the way down to Kobe. I said, I'm not going to yell tonight. I'm not going to do it. I prayed to God. I've asked for strength. I'm not going to do it. My son screwed up. Pray, grab a hold of him. Vicky said, I thought you weren't going to yell. I'm not going to yell at the refs. <laughs> I'm going to change my mind a little bit. Where's the enthusiasm? The excitement. Because Satan wants to know, what do I got to do to get you down? Look at Job. I'll get your health. I'll take your health away from you. Would hearing... You have cancer, get you to quit. He took away his money. One by one, the servants came in and said, I'm sorry, but the cows died. I'm sorry, the camels died. I'm sorry, the mules are dead. I'm sorry. Is that what it's going to take? Your pocketbook to go empty? That you start doubting God? How about the third thing he took away from him? I'm going to come after your kids. Would that get you to quit? I'm going to take their life away from them. I'm going to make them walk away from you. I'm going to make your life a living hell. Would that get you to surrender? Jesus is asking, what's it going to take to keep you started? To get you going? Keep you motivated? How about some confidence? 
you want to get into a quarterback's head, you take away his confidence. He won't throw the ball anymore. If you keep intercepting it, if you keep knocking it down, if you keep getting up there and you're, come on, bring it in, he'll, he'll get afraid. Story about a game, and it was a horrible, horrible loss, and, and the coach yelled in there and said, give John Henry the ball, and the quarterback kept it and tried to run. He said, hey, give John Henry the ball, and they tried to throw it, and it didn't work. He said, give John Henry the ball, and the little head came out of the huddle and said, John Henry said he don't want it. How about some confidence? You're coming at me with a sword, but I'm coming at you with the Almighty. That's confidence. How about we say we're, we're going to rock this place? How about some praying with confidence that you know God's listening and God's going to move and God's going to do some great and mighty things and I'm going to go to God in confidence knowing He hears me and I'm going to get my marching orders. Dear God, I'm here. What do you want me to do today? So what the doctor says this, or so what the bank says this, or so what, so what, I am here and I'm going to show up and I'm going to give 100%. Because when people are done with me and they've been around me long enough, I want them to know that I serve a risen Savior. And He's taken note of my life. Not only are you supposed to stand your ground, He says take more. Don't be satisfied with just a little bit. Don't be satisfied where you're at. Go back. Get more ground. People get upset when they see a team run up the score. I love that. I didn't like it when they did it on us. But I, you know, when I was in high school, I loved it when our basketball team ran up the score. You know why? It meant I got to get into play. I was watching the football game yesterday. I was watching Jace, and I was hoping Jace would get in. But you know what? He was in the whole time. He had his helmet on, I'm ready to go. He was watching where the coaches were and he was listening to the play. What I don't like is watching somebody who don't think they're going to get in and they act like it on the sideline. They're over there goofing off and slapping somebody and, and not paying attention. They don't have any idea what's going on and the coach calls their name. They don't know where their mouthpiece is. They don't know where their helmet is. And they're wasting time. Keep your head in the game. You never know when your number's going to be called. You keep your head in the game. And you move forward. We are not of those who look back. So what? You have a sketchy past. I told a guy this week, he didn't think he was worthy to go to church. And I said, let me tell you this, I'm just glad that I did all my stupid stuff before social media showed up. So what? You have a sketchy past. What's your future look like? When I was a kid, I don't remember where I saw this picture, but I had to find this picture. What happened to this mentality? Some of you are being swallowed up by the world. That's what it feels like right now. And if I, I mean, I'm being swallowed whole. What happened to the fight? What happened to, I'm not going to give in at all costs. I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to go back to my knees. I'm going to find what God is asking me to do. I'm going to keep the fight real. I'm not going to be swallowed whole. What happened to the Christians like this? Do you realize all over the world, Christians today right now are meeting together knowing that their lives are at stake because they're gathering together? And if we have a beautiful sunny day, we can't get people here because it might be somewhere else. <laughs> what happened to this? Some of you right now, and I, I want to be honest, you're at that point, you're at that breaking point. And right now, you're, you're, you're done. You don't feel this excitement. You don't feel this fervor. Maybe it's because you feel like you're alone. And, and that's where I want to get to this. The church, each and every one of us individually, is one link in a chain. And you know as well as I do, a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. So the church is built and established so when we have a weak link, our job is to go around that person and nurture that person and build them up to encourage them, to strengthen them, because we all know the church is only as strong as the weakest link. So what does the link mean? And I got this sermon years ago from a promise keeper's rally, and I've got these notes. 
And it says this, the link is a person who's willing to lay down their life daily. Every day I'm going to put my life on the line. And I'm going to do that through an intimate, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. The word intimacy means into me see. And I'm going to let God reveal himself in my life through scripture and, and Bible reading and praying and getting around other people and going to church on Sundays. I want to be so close to Jesus Christ that there's no gap, that I'm not making a mistake. And then I'm going to receive the new power. Now when you become a Christian, you receive the Holy Spirit. But you get lax. And, and you, you don't give 100%. A few years ago, I trained for a, it's called the Illinois Challenge. It's the U of I, and I got to run on the U of I, University of Illinois. I got to run on their football field. I got to be on the Jumbotron. If I'm up big enough, they blow you up there. Boy, you look really big up there. And what you do on a Friday night, you run a 5K. And, and I tell myself, I'm only going to run about a 40-minute 5K. I, I don't want to run it too fast. I'm going to run it kind of... You're a little too old for that bottle, son. All right. I'm going to run it kind of slow. But here's what they do. They, they rev up the music before you go. There's 10, 15,000 people in the crowd and they hoop and holler and they get you all excited and you take off down a hill and when you take it off down the hill there's a huge United States American flag on two fire truck ladder trucks and you run under that flag next thing I know I did it in under 27 minutes because you just can't up you're so excited about what's going on and you're running your race and I sped up a little bit because the band was running by me and they were holding their tubas playing their tubas running by me and I'm like that kind of your Harleys. There we go. I did that. And that's kind of embarrassing to have a guy bigger than you playing his tube going by you. So the next time I ran it, I got ahead a little bit so I could, you know. But you run a 5K, then the next morning you get up and run a full marathon. I started this because my sister-in-law was dying of a brain tumor. And that got me into running for uh, brain tumor research. I'd go to all these different, we'd go as a family and we'd go to Chicago and run in Chicago. And um, so I wanted to run a marathon before she died. My goal was to do it in five hours. And the morning of the marathon, it had a little drizzle, it was cold, it was an early April day. And I prayed to God they'd cancel the marathon so we wouldn't have to run it. But. Uh, they went ahead and ran it, and, it was, and I had jelly beans in my pocket. And every two hours, you've got to eat. And, and so, or every two miles, you've got to eat. And then so you keep these, well, these jelly beans turn into one just big gall of goo in my pocket. And I'm trying to tear them off and eat, and they're, they're just sticking. I've got to pull them out, and I've got all kinds of lint and stuff on them. And as you're running, they've got these little stations, and they've got goo packs. Anybody eat a goo pack? It's just a pack of cart sugar, and it was chocolate flavored, and I thought, I handed, got a few extra, shoved them in my pocket. I didn't realize I already had them open. And when I reached out of my pocket and pulled out brown, I'm like, oh, good Lord. <laughs> I scared myself, didn't I? You know, kind of thing. <laughs> oh, sorry. I wanted to quit at mile 20. I was done. I had it all. I've, I've ran further than I've ever ran. I'm wet. I'm cold. I'm done. And if I knew where I was at in Champaign, I probably would have walked back to my car. I was done. Around the corner, I see my wife and my three boys ringing bells and holding signs. The one that got me was Jay's sign, you need to finish or I'll be embarrassed the rest of my life. <laughs> Everybody has their own way of motivating. <laughs> Those signs are still in my basement hanging up, but it was my family encouraging me to keep going. That's church. That new spirit we get, that, that revitalization, that's what kept me going the rest of the, the, rest of the race. And then you've got to be kingdom service. It's about the whole thing. Look what 2 Chronicles 20 says. You won't have to lift a hand in this battle. Just stand firm and watch God's saving work. Don't be afraid. Don't waver. March out boldly today. God's with you. Maybe sometimes we just need to be reminded somebody's got our back. 
during that game, Falk was supposed to have Green's back. Green trusted he was going to take care of him. In an article, he said, I, I wasn't even afraid of Harrison. I knew, I knew Falk was going to do his job. Falk didn't. Green was taken out for the whole year. But let me tell you, I got your back. Every one of us needs to hear that somebody else is pulling for us. I've got you. And I went and, Brent, help me. We've got a bunch of these links. When you leave, I want you to take one of these, put it on your keychain. And maybe you're feeling weak today, and maybe you're the one feeling like, I, I just can't. I'm done. Find somebody and pull them to the side and say, hey, would you pray with me? Some of you are, are, are dying in silence. Go get somebody. Go, go, go sit down with somebody. Go ask somebody to buy you a cup of coffee. Say, man, I really need to talk. When you leave here today, I want you to take one of these, but I also want you to look around. Look into somebody's eyes. Look into their soul. Maybe you put their, your hand on their back. And just whisper in there, hey, I, I got you. I got your back. They did a research, and I don't know how they did this research, but these, they had these draft horses. And these draft horses, one would pull 9,000 pounds by himself. And they put him, tied him up next to a, a draft horse that would pull 7,000 pounds. Thinking they should at least pull 16, at least 15. When they got all said and done, they had these horses pulling 30,000 pounds. Three times because they were next to somebody else, taking half the weight, encouraging them to keep going. That's church. I'm here to encourage you. Your victory is just around the corner. Don't quit now. Don't stop. You know how embarrassed I would be if I stood up here today and told you that I quit that race? But I'm one of 1% who has finished a marathon. And I finished it in my five-hour time slot. My whole body hurt. I had burn marks where I didn't know you could have rub marks. I was cold. But I finished strong. Because I had a family encouraging me. That's church. Don't quit. Don't you dare quit. Your victory's around the corner. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And you don't have that indwelling power. I'm dressed to do a baptism. I'll get in the water just like this. Maybe you've lost your excitement, your zeal. And you know what? It's just a prayer away. Maybe you need to hear, I got your back. Hey, I got your back. It's decision time. Would you stand and let me pray? Almighty God, as we are here today, if someone needs to make a decision, Maybe, Father, someone needs to feel your power again or your, the excitement. Maybe someone needs just an arm around them knowing that someone else cares. Father, Spirit, I pray your Spirit move today. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.